Hi everyone and welcome to the latest development log. In this log I want to focus on a couple of features that I've been adding to the to Wasp in the latest version that you might find on GitHub and which revolve around the uh, field section of Wasp. So specifically what I've been doing is I've been adding uh, the possibility of making fields orientable meaning that now fields have a custom plane that would allow you to orient uh, the plane grid, the, the, vo the field grid in space, as well as then once you create the field, orient it and move it in space in order to create a copy of this field in different locations in your file. In order to then visualize these different changes that you might add to your field, I've added to the already existing uh, ISO curve preview. Uh, for fields, a second preview mode which allows you to generate a voxel mesh to preview specific uh, ISO levels in your uh, field. And besides fields, I'm going to also show you something that is a little bit more in the making still in WASP, which is the serialization section. And what this serialization section uh, deals with, it deals with allowing you to convert to a text file and then save any WASP class. So you could convert a part, you could convert a field, you could convert an aggregation. And what this gonna allow you, well right now it's still in progress, but it will allow you in the future to save any component of a WASP aggregation and then reload it in a separate file or also share it with different users. And the ultimate goal of this is to make uh, WASP aggregations and WASP elements 100% shareable to a wider community. So Let's get started. I'm gonna be working from uh, a basic field aggregation file. If you wanna use it, you might find it. This is the field from uh, tutorial number eight in the WASP 101 uh, series. And all this, field, all this file contains is a simple aggregation that uh, is based on a truncated octahedron and this aggregation uh, follows a curve and varies of the distance. And now, if you go and check the um, the field points component, you will notice that this the field point component has a new input, and this new input is uh, the base plane of the field. So by default, this base plane will always be assigned to the word x y, and let's go and take a look to see what this really means. If we take the uh, generated field and we go to fields and get at the construct field component. You see that when we deconstruct it, we deconstruct the field and get all the components. But if now we go on and deactivate the preview of this component and just create a plane component, as well as a geometry, you will see that we have two outputs. And so the first output is a plane, which is stored in the lowest uh, bottom left corner of your aggregation which is the actual base plane of this field and the second is a bounding box that defines the boundary of your field now if we take a look at the points of this field you'll see that by default the points follow a grid that is aligned to the word x y and while this is probably fine in most cases. There are certain cases in which you might want to create a, a grid that follows a different orientation. Now, this is exactly what this plane input that you find on the empty field component is for. So if now here, instead of using a simply XY plane, I would first create an XY plane and then using a rotate plane component go on and change the orientation of this plane. So for example, I'm going to right click, set the angle to degree and rotate this plane of 45 degrees. If I now assign this plane as the base plane of my field, the field will be recomputed and the grid will now follow not anymore the X, Y, Z uh, axis, but it will follow the specific axis that I specified with this plane. And if now I take a look, you'll see that now the base plane that I can find here has been oriented in this way. What's interesting is that this does not only affect the field. So we can take a look and create a preview by using a custom preview on our points. 
and a gradient to visualize the values. So what you see is that we have still a field that has high values whenever we are close to the to the curve and then all the values are zero outside the bounds box but the orientation of this grid is now following the plane we specified. And what's also interesting is that if I go on and hide this one for a second what's interesting is that if we now go and reset our aggregation you will notice that oh you not this is not maybe the best orientation to see that, but for example, I'm going to change it to 30 degrees. And if I now reset my aggregation, you will notice that also the orientation of my parts as they are placed in the field has been changed to follow the, uh, the orientation of the field grid. So what this allows you now to do is not anymore to always be fixed to this uh, XYZ Cartesian axis, but also to kind of orient this in space. And what's interesting is that you can do this not just on an XY plane, but you can also do this uh, in 3D space. So for example, if I would have to take this plane and create a rotate 3D component, take my base plane, which I have there, and rotate it, for example, of, I don't know, 45 degrees, or maybe, let's say, 35 degrees. Uh, but this time, I'm going to rotate it around the x-axis, so I'm going to not only rotate it flat, but also put it out. Oops. If I will now assign this plane here, it's going to take a bit more to calculate, because the the box will become much bigger. But if I go and look at my points, you now that you see that now my field follows this uh, grid in 3D space. And if we now go on and change the orientation, you see that now my uh, octahedrons are oriented along that grid in uh, both directions. So both rotated around the z-axis as well as rotated around the uh, x-axis. So now, what's also interesting is that as we have for each field, we have this custom plane input that specifies where this uh, field is in space. What we can also do is we can also now take that plane and change it in order to reposition our field in space as we want. So to do that, for example, I'm going to right now make this a bit smaller so it's not too crazy. So if I would, for example, want to take this field and move it and flip it even and put it vertically, I could do that by simply going to my created field that I have here, go under field and take a new component that is called orient field. And what this field does is it allows you to take this plane and given a new plane, orient this whole field according to the new plane. So I'm gonna assign my field here. And then I'm gonna, for example, create an XZ plane. And I'm gonna give it uh, a point. So with construct point. I'm gonna assign a point, which I'm gonna, for example, position somewhere in space. So let's say 350, 250. So that means that now that's gonna be my target plane. And if I now assign this one to that, the plane gets automatically transformed to that new coordinate system. And if I wanna preview it with my preview component, you will see that that's what I've done. I could also visualize the points. And you see that I moved the field, keeping all the values arranged in the same way, but I now positioned it in this way. And if I now would go and replace this field in my field component and reset, my aggregation will follow along and will be recreated in that orientation. 
So the idea of this one is that what this would allow you is once you created a base field that could, for example, represent some sort of an aggregated object, some sort of an architecture, architectural object or an urban arrangement and so on, you could just proliferate the same field in different areas and create various aggregation in different areas which follow the same guiding field but could for example have different sizes or have different type of parts following the same uh, component. And so this should allow you to have a lot of flexibility when working with fields. Now of course, when you start taking a field and moving it around and creating it, uh, it becomes a bit harder to follow and make sure that you always know where your field uh, is and how your field will look like. For this reason, I added uh, a new preview component. So you might be familiar with the component preview component that was there before, which is the isolines component. But I've now added a second component that is an isovoxel which will create a mesh which envelops the amount of the area of the field which has the specific value you assign. So if we add this component here for example I know my field is there. So this is my field. If I now I'm gonna assign a field to the isovoxel component and then I could specify a value that I would like to visualize and I'm going to, for example, say 0 0.5. This will very quickly compute uh, ISO, a, an ISO surface, a voxelized ISO surface that uh, represents all the area of the uh, field that has inside values that are above 0 0.5. And you can just change this one very quickly and visualize different areas. You could, for example, create a custom preview with maybe a semi-transparent swatch. So in this case I'm gonna set it there and set it to black but put the alpha very low. And if I then turn the preview off and now have this shadow like which actually allows me to visualize how my field changes. What you could also do is you could also create use a range component to set different ISO levels and then you would actually get this visualization in which you will see uh, darker areas where the field is stronger and then lighter areas as the field gets uh, as the fields gets um, lower values. So of course you can use this also to just calculate ISO surfaces on different fields and just use that as a design object as well. And so yeah this is it for uh, what it regards uh, the fields component and so these changes are now in a beta version as they, there's quite a lot of change in the background on how this is calculated. So I want to just roll it out to you guys and let you test it and hope that everything works out. Of course if there's any bug just let me know. And now I want to show you another little addition. It's actually not so little from the programming side, but for now it's just one component, which is uh, the brand new Wasp serializer. So what a serializer is, if if you're familiar with programming, is something that takes uh, an an object, a class that you've been programming, and converts it to a text representation that can then be saved and shared and reloaded. So what I've been doing over the last three weeks is adding to every single class of WASP a method that allows to take that WASP class and convert it to a, a serialized object. So what this would, is supposed to allow you to do, it's now not entirely done, but what will allow you to do in the future is it will allow you to take any WASP class, save it to a text file and then share it with other users upload it, like load it in a different file, and then you could start creating things in which by just sharing these files you could use uh, the field from one definition and the parts from another definition and the constraints from another definition, quickly reload them in a, grass, in a grasshopper definition and create combinations. So the idea of this one is that eventually you could start thinking of building up repositories of these files which you could then very quickly load to create a variety of designs and a variety of uh, different options and different uh, aggregation. 
So I'm going to show you quickly how this component works. And you'll find it in the experimental tab. And this component is called serialize objects to file. And I'm going to, for example, try to see what, what happens when I try to serialize the part. So this component has an object input that can take any wasp class, actually any except for the attributes, because the attributes are not yet figured out. But that's going to be figured out as well soon. And so it can take any wasp class. And without doing anything else, it's going to return you some information. So the first thing that it's going to return you is it's going to return you all the available parameters that are set in this class. So you see that, for example, here, if I serialize uh, a, a part component, I'm going to have the parents of the part, the, the geometry as it's saved, the name of the part, its connection, the ID, the transformation that has been applied to it, which connections are active, and so on. Just for you to see, if I, for example, would connect a connection class, that's going to give me just four. So it's going to get one for each of them right now. But it's going to give me just four, um, four keys, which are the ID of the connection, the part it belongs to, the plane that defines the connection, and the connection type. And this works for literally any thing. So for example, if I would connect a field, oops, something went wrong because that's an empty field. So if I would connect the field, I'm going to get all the fields that are set in the field. So the resolution, the name, the count, the plane, the values, the points, and the boundaries. So And that works literally for any WASP class. So let's go back to our part. On top of all these keys, what these keys are there and what you can use them for is that besides these keys, you'll see that here you get a text representation which contains the, the text that will represent this class once it's being saved. Now, by default, all these fields are converted to text and saved. But for some reasons, you might want to have different ones. And so if you, for example, create a panel, uncheck multiline data. And then, for example, say that I just want to save the name and the connections of a part. So I'm just going to type, type name connections and now connect it here and now you see that the generated text file contains just the name of the part and the connections of it. Now of course here the same way as any other save component you can set a path a file name and with a button then save that file but you'll see that and what this does will create a JSON file that will store all this information. Now for for this version I haven't yet added a deserializer that would allow you to load that but I'm going to be doing that pretty soon. Now, one little note of uh, care is when you start serializing, when you serialize parts or connections, that's not going to be a big problem because they're not relatively large files. But if you start serializing things like a field or even worse, an aggregation, uh, this text file will start becoming huge. So I tried serializing an aggregation, a field aggregation with around 1,000 parts, and the generated text file was more than 100 megabytes. So if you have a panel connected here, and Grasshopper has to display that huge amount of text, it will most likely crash. So on a general note, don't use this one. But just make sure that you have this, and then you can save your JSON file and open it outside. Now, I'm really excited about this. And if it's not clear what really this is about, I think it's normal. It's kind of a nerdy thing. But stay tuned. I'm going to pretty soon add new features to this serialization. And you will see how it's, it's going to become very easy to then save and load different things and kind of do some sort of a mix and match of different um, aggregations. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you will enjoy these new features. As always, let me know if something is not working or if there's any bugs or if you have any ideas about how to do this in a different way. And I'm gonna do my best to answer to you and then hopefully fix the bugs and add new features in the coming version. For now, thanks for watching.
subscribe to the channel and stay to stay updated and see you in the next tutorial or log let's see what comes bye